Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. This podcast was sponsored by Janus Henderson Investors. As such, the sponsor may make suggestions for discussion, but the final control remains with the Investment Innovation Institute. Welcome to the i3 podcast. I'm here today with Julian McManus, who is a portfolio manager on the Global Alpha Equity Team at Janus Henderson Investors. And today we're going to talk about global equities. Julian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me today. No problem. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got into investing and into the asset management industry? Yes, sure. Well, I originally studied Japanese and law at college uh, in London, the University of London. And um, when I came to graduate, the lawyers uh, at the law firms that I interviewed with were uh, uniformly miserable and I decided not to go into a profession in the law, but I did have some college classmates who were a couple of years ahead of me uh, at college who had already joined the buy side. And they described to me how intellectual rewarding uh, th- it was to do your own research and, and put capital behind your conviction. Uh, and this sounded like a really good fit for me. And uh, I also wanted to work in Japan. Um, and so I got my start by joining Lazard asset management in Japan, uh, first as an analyst and then became a PM. So what attracted you to Japan? Uh, Well, I was fascinated by Japanese culture growing up. Uh, As a teenager, Japan was just bursting onto the global scene in the 80s. Um, Most people hadn't really come into contact with with Japanese culture. And uh, and the more I learned about Japanese culture and, and the place and the people and the history, and what a rich, diverse sort of uh, cultural heritage they had. It just made me want to learn more about it and only fed that that hunger. And so I decided the only way uh, to satisfy that hunger was to actually study the language and, and go live there for a while. So how long did you end up spending in Japan? Uh, so I was there for six years, uh, from 94 to 2000, uh, most of the 90s after the bubble burst. Yeah, yeah. It must have been quite an uh, interesting time there. It, it was quite a quite a, tr- a tough training ground investing in a bear market, um, but uh, a lot of valuable lessons were learned there for sure. Yeah. So with Japanese equities uh, in your background, is that still part of your global portfolio? Yes, it is. Uh, we still invest in Japan very much so. In, in fact, Japan is a really important part of our portfolio, partly because it's such a rich uh, hunting ground for alpha um, because you do get pockets of the Japanese market that can be quite inefficient. Um, But also it's a great diversifier because Japan has been quite uncorrelated with the rest of the world. Um, And so it can be a a really good addition to a portfolio because you can get alpha that's relatively uncorrelated with the rest of your portfolio. There's been quite a few developments in the Japanese equity market in recent years. And I think uh, Mm -hmm. an important one is where uh, they, they put together this index where they basically were rewarding companies that had good return on uh, investments. Mm-hmm. What is your opinion on that? Has that significantly changed the market? Yes, it, it has changed the market and it's it's added a level of urgency that didn't exist before. I would say that, I would just preface that by saying that, in fact, change had been going on behind the scenes, very much under the radar for the last 10 years. But because it was such a slow burn, I think a lot of global investors really didn't appreciate what was happening. And the the beginning of that was when Prime Minister Abe 
uh, who's sadly passed away now, when he came in in 2012, he instituted two really important reforms, the uh, stewardship code for investors like ourselves and the corporate governance code for corporates. And these both really enshrined a need to be more accountable to shareholders and to explain where uh, governance wasn't as good as it could be. And what it effectively did was it it forced uh, a whole massive improvement in corporate governance and capital allocation uh, across a lot of large companies. But it took a long time to, to play out because unwinding cross shareholdings uh, was a, a tricky process that culturally you had to go to your um, counterparties or even your customers in many cases and explain why you needed to sell their shares. So that process took a long time. But when you got to 2022, 2023, most of these companies had unwound the majority of their cross holdings. This still in progress in some places. And then what that meant was that most of these companies were naked the protection of having friendly cross holders that they used to count on uh, in the past. So that when the Tokyo Stock Exchange did come to them and say, your, your stock's trading below book value, you need to do something about it, or we're going to delist you potentially. It suddenly introduced uh, a lot of urgency and, and it really got people's attention. And I think there are quite a few opportunities still existing in Japan. The, the obvious ones of fast money, just buying uh, baskets of stocks below one times book value, um, and bidding them up to book value, that that trade has already happened. And it's not particularly creative or, or imaginative. It's just a quant trade. I think the value is going to be from here, having the fundamental analysis, the boots on the ground and the research and the relationships to understand where the potential for improvement now lies uh, with the rest of, of Japan. So there are a lot of cash rich companies that can improve their capital efficiency by buying back shares. There are uh, other companies that, that can do other things. Um, and so th there's a lot of potential still on the ground in Japan. Yeah. I read recently an article that uh, the Japanese economy is as close to normalization as it ever has been. Do you agree with that? Uh, I do. I, I, I think actually uh, Japan has quite a bright future, especially when compared with its past. And um, so while global investors, I think, have tended to overlook Japan uh, over the last decade or so in, in favor of more exciting stories like China, Japan has, has gone through this transformation that I just sort of laid out. And I think because it was spread over a decade, it wasn't well appreciated, but the change has been very deep, uh, very profound. And, and then in addition to that change, I think the demographics of a falling population mean that we're actually going to see rising real wages for the first time in a long time, which means inflation that's probably sustainable. So that's helped Japan escape from the deflation trap that they've been stuck in for a couple of decades. Then in addition to the corporate governance that I mentioned, the government itself has woken up to the urgency around creating national champions in strategically important industries. Um, so think supply chains like semiconductors um, and semiconductor materials as well. So often underappreciated is that Japan is the main source uh, for silicon wafers um, and also a lot of the chemicals that go on top of those silicon wafers when you're making semiconductors. And so um, there's some really exciting things happening in Japan witness a TSMC recently starting their first fab in Japan um, outside of Taiwan, so ahead of Germany and ahead of the US, which I think is quite impressive. It speaks to how, how much urgency was brought to bear to make this happen. You had government working with the private sector. Um, and then there's another company called Rapidus, which is also backed by the Japanese government in Hokkaido, and that also bears watching. So I think Japan is going to be one of the most important semiconductor uh, production hubs globally um, outside of Taiwan. And um, and that's just one example. Uh, autos, I think, is the other area where they're going to be world leading as Toyota transitions from hybrids to EVs. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting story in itself, because 
I think uh, with Toyota, Toyota uh, putting their money on the hybrids, they sort of maybe foresaw that the transition takes a lot longer than people yes. were initially expecting. So I think most people, you know, they're interested in electric vehicles, but they probably hatch the bets, especially in Australia. Yes. And go for the hybrid option first. Very much so. I, I, in fact, I was just out with Toyota uh, two weeks ago on the West Coast for the launch of their new hybrid models and uh, spent a lot of time speaking with different people in the organization. And what was interesting was that while they still feel that longer term hydrogen fuel cells are the ultimate destination for transportation, uh, the infrastructure isn't, isn't even close to being ready for that yet. Um, and so they're very very much adopting a pragmatic approach, which is for the time being, sell the market what the market wants, which is hybrids. And in fact, um, their research suggests that many uh, many of their customers who would like to have an EV are buying an EV as an experiment, but their other car is a hybrid. And, and, um, and so they're not ready to, to let go completely of the ICE engine or the hybrid yet. And, and what's nice for Toyota is that while that continues to be the case, and literally they can't satisfy all the demand for hybrids, um, they're down to two days of inventory, they make more money on hybrids than they do on, on uh, regular ICE vehicles or EVs. So when they do get to the point when their EV battery technology is ready for prime time in 2027, they'll actually get to that point in really good shape with uh, very high margins and a lot of cash on the balance sheet. Um, so I, I think, yeah, companies like like Toyota are extremely well positioned. Yeah, it's very interesting. I, I was looking the other day at the uh, the hybrid REV4 Toyota, and it had a yeah. note on there that said, well, it's going to take at least 18 months, and by the time, it might be not the same model, and by the way, it might be more expensive as well. Yeah. <laughs> there seems to be a bit of demand for these uh, vehicles. Yes, they're, they're having trouble uh, uh, satisfying demand, but uh, they'll they'll get there, but it'll take them a while. Yeah. So you spent six years in Japan, uh, but these days you're based in, in Denver and um, mm -hmm. in the United States. And, and when I sort of uh, read a few of your articles uh, on, on the website, I found that often you say, you basically seem to discuss that uh, um, there's a lot of merits in stocks outside of the U.S. Yes. Do you think that there's that the investment industry places too much emphasis on U.S. stocks? I, I think there is a certain amount of complacency, um, and and the home market bias is is real, uh, particularly for on the part of U.S. investors, and it's understandable because for many years the U.S. has outperformed. The rest of the world. Um, and in some cases, I think the industry is right to focus on the degree of innovation going on in technology in the US. The US is definitely leading the charge there. With scaled internet platforms and now AI, um, it's, it's very difficult for the rest of the world to compete with Silicon's Valley, uh, sorry, Silicon Valley's um, mixture of light regulation and aggressive incentive structures and access to patient capital. And um, so the valuations of some, some of these companies, I think make sense, but I think there is a tendency to perhaps ignore the rest of the world and just assume that, that the US is the place to invest and international is where you go on vacation. <laughs> the, the reality is there are some really great, important companies outside of the US. You know, I mentioned TSMC and Toyota already, but um, ASML, the Dutch lithography company, which I'm sure you're very familiar with. Absolutely. And these are these are all crucially, very strategically important companies that you know exist outside the US. And um, they're just a, a small sample. There are many great companies that you know we can buy outside the US that oftentimes are fantastic business models. And um, once in a while you get to buy them at a discount because of short-term uh, reasons they might be out of favor. Uh, and so it's it's really important to to be able to benefit from the whole opportunity set and not just limit yourself to the U.S. Yeah, but we have seen the the performance of the Magnificent Seven being so dominant, mm -hmm. especially last year. Yeah, I, I remember looking at it uh, at one stage where it pretty much explained like 
9.5% of the 9.7% increase over the year and everything yeah. else has done nothing. So if you look at those companies and you look at the ones that you mentioned, ASML, TSMC, and I think there's a Korean company as well, SK, Hynex, why haven't they increased along with the Magnificent 7 so much? So they're starting to, but with a delay. Um, so I think very much the, the, the excitement centered, first of all, around AI and the epicenter of that was in the, the US. Uh, companies like OpenAI, which is still private, but Microsoft arguably gets you some exposure to that. And I think the reason why those other companies somewhat lagged, there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, because they were outside the US, they were considered still uh, somewhat, you know, one step removed, at least. There was also a an inventory cycle that TSMC and ASML have been digesting that has meant that th those stocks were somewhat out of favor. And SK Hynix until a year ago was very much out of favor. It's very cyclical because it, it makes memory, you know, DRAM memory chips primarily. Because they were still digesting that inventory uh, problem, they were still out of favor. And so the market was slower to come back to them. It's starting to re-rate them. But the other thing that's at work here is that I think in the case of ASML, many European investors just have a really hard time paying more than 25 times earnings for uh, even a fantastic growth company like ASML. I think for some reason, historically, 25 times you know, one year forward earnings just seems to form a, a mental barrier for people. And and it's difficult for them to get over that. They say, well, I'm not paying more than 25 times for, for any stock in Europe, you know. But the reality is that ASML is in a position where they enjoy a monopoly on EUV lithography today. That's really the cutting edge uh, machinery that's going into TSMC's fabs and, and Samsung's. But it's going to have a monopoly on all the the next generation as well that we go forward from at EUV to high NA and then hyper NA that there's no one else who's, who's going to be able to do that. And so I think the mistake that the market make, makes there is it tends to fade the growth rates prematurely and it's expecting those monopoly economics to go away. But I think this is one of those special cases where they don't go away and it persists. So as a, as a long-term investor, you would think like these companies have uh, near monopolies or monopolies in some cases. That's obviously the place to be in. Yes, I, I think so. I very much think so. Uh, and TSMC is um, a really good example of this because it's even cheaper than ASML. And, and what's interesting is that in the case of TSMC, I think that investors understandably attach an outsized geopolitical risk premium to the stock when they value it. When we run our DCF valuation analysis on what the market is assuming for future profitability and growth rates at TSMC, uh, it doesn't line up with today's share price unless you use an extremely high cost of capital. And that's what the market's doing. It's saying, we think that TSMC's cost of capital shouldn't be eight to 10% as it in, is most of the time in the rest of the world it should be 15%. And I understand why the market is somewhat hesitant uh, when it comes to thinking about geopolitical risk in Taiwan. But in fact, we have to remember that TSMC isn't living in a vacuum. TSMC is very connected to the rest of the world. And if TSMC has a, a Taiwan problem, then so does Apple. Yeah, And not just Apple, probably half of the world's automakers as well. And, and we remember uh, the, the supply chain disruptions that, that came out of COVID. You know, if the worst ever happens in Taiwan, it's going to be much greater than that in terms of disruption for the rest of the world um, and not just TSMC. Uh, and so I think when the market effectively assumes or underwrites 10% growth at Apple uh, for the next 10 years, but has a very different set of assumptions for, for TSMC, there's a big dis disconnect there. And that's the kind of disconnect that we like to take advantage of. So you mentioned those geopolitical influences when we're looking at TSMC. 
Mm-hmm. How do you look at that? Do you try to um, incorporate it into your evaluation process or do you more observe it as a potential outside influence that you just need to be aware of? So we think about it at both levels, both at the uh, stock selection level and the portfolio construction level. Those are two very separate steps for us. Um, obviously, on the on the stock selection level, we have to get comfortable with with the geopolitical risks that that exist uh, around that uh, holding. In the case of TSMC, we believe that China is actually nowhere near in a position to ever invade uh, Taiwan, uh, at least not during our investment time horizon. It's very unlikely that that China is going to be able to get rid of its dependence on fuel, uh, you know, fossil fuel imports, and also food imports from the US, for example. Um, but separately, you know, when we think about geopolitical risk, we think about in Brazil, for example, the direction that politics have been going, it's been going steadily in the wrong direction, where many of the reforms that were put in place by President Cardoso back in the day have been one by one dismantled by a series of populist po- politicians. And so Brazil is, is you know, going in the wrong direction, in our opinion. Um, and then secondly, at the portfolio construction level, we definitely think about portfolio construction in qualitative terms. So yes, we use risk tools and that think in terms of historical correlations that help us with our, our risk management and our position sizing. But we also think about how could this portfolio interact if if we had tail risk events. So, for example, we own uh, British Aerospace BAE Systems, which is a, a very large defense contractor based in the UK, but it has a large business in the US as well. About half of its business, in fact, comes from the US. And mm-hmm. our thinking is, if the worst were ever to actually uh, happen in Taiwan. Um, yes, uh, our TSMC position would probably be impaired, um, but we would probably make twice that uh, impairment on BAE systems. And by owning a large position in BAE, that enables us to have a large position in TSMC as well. So it's important to think about the portfolio as a living, breathing entity that interacts. Yeah, and how it's all interconnected. Yes. In, in in that sense, I think you mentioned that um, when we look again at the Magnificent Seven, you said some of the valuations uh, might be justified. Yeah. Does that mean that you hold any in the portfolio or is there too much downside risk on these seven stocks? Yes, we do, actually. We own three. So we own uh, Amazon, Microsoft and Meta. E- each has its own reasons, um, but they, they we feel that the valuations there are actually reasonable and on the low side uh, for example amazon you know trades we get that on uh, close to a five percent free cash flow yield and in some ways its retail business is really on its way to becoming staple like business it's unlikely that you could find many staples that trade on a five percent free cash flow yield today um, generally they trade uh, below that um, and so we think that you know amazon's People are using the wrong valuation metrics there. Um, in Meta, we believe that actually there's a lot of room for improvement still there. They're burning about $20 billion a year in cash in their labs uh, segment that they could, they could either that might turn profitable one day or they could just stop spending there. Um, and we think their, their basic core business still has room to improve and grow um, now that they've got around uh, the, the challenges of, of Apple and IDFA. Um, so, you know, 20 times earnings, we think Meta is not actually expensive at all. Um, and then Microsoft, everybody knows that business well, but they've they've really reinvented themselves in an impressive way. Um, not only is the, the cloud business doing extremely well, but of course, they are probably in a prime position on AI, owning a stake in it, open AI, and, and they'll be leading the charge there for some time to come. So in, in many ways, um, we, we see what's happening in technology is being uh, on the cusp of further accelerating. Um, and these scaled platforms are extremely pro- profitable uh, as they grow. And so not all MAG7 names are, are overvalued. We haven't, you know, we've, we've believed for a long time that Apple and Tesla were, uh, 
were very overvalued and we've avoided those um which is you know now tesla's that's definitely um proving to be a, a good decision but i think apple similarly will go this not quite as extreme a fashion but you know apple's not growing and it's still valued at you know 20 25 times earnings it used to trade at 10 times earnings when it didn't grow in times gone by so um you know, we, we think it's a really important to differentiate within the Magnificent Seven. Uh, and that's, again, a good opportunity for stock pickers. Yeah. So AI is a, is a key driver behind uh, the Magnificent Seven. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, it allows for scalability. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's also some questions around, you know, is this another dot-com uh, boom? Because even though it's, it's quite exciting technology and especially some of the recent ones that came out of the video manipulation by just text to yeah. video, uh, yes. which does some amazing things. But at the same time, that doesn't always necessarily lead to efficiencies and, and, and greater profitability. Yes. Um, is, is, is there a danger that we're facing another dot com here? I don't think so. I, I, I think that you'll always get excessive excitement in, in one corner of the market or another. But the reason why I think there's so much potential here is because in some in some ways we actually see the acceleration that I referenced. So we're seeing a feedback loop where AI is being deployed at the semiconductor software design uh, tools to further accelerate development of the next generation semiconductors, which again can make AI more powerful. Um, and and this is the first time I've seen such an exciting flywheel or, or or potential for an accelerating feedback loop and so that's one reason why i'm excited the other is i think we often we say here that people tend to overestimate what's possible in one year and underestimate what's possible in 10 years and i think this is one of those cases uh, where there's a lot of potential the initial use cases take a little bit of time for people to figure out but once they get there then there's another uh, sort of step up in terms of productivity and how it's implemented. So I was recently, as an example, I was recently speaking with the CEO of a large bank in the UK and um, asked them about this. How, what are the true AI use cases? Um, and and he, he outlined that the amount of their uh, SGNA that is spent on, on labor and the amount of that spent on reporting functions and documentation is substantial. And a lot of those kind of uh, jobs can be, a lot of that work can be either automated or, or at least partially replaced by AI functions. And so um, it's quite likely that you're going to see a huge uplift in productivity there. Um, and then the question is, and the CEO addressed this, the question, uh, and he called it the uncomfortable question, is is how are they going to use those productivity gains? Will they reinvest them uh, or will they just let them drop to the bottom line? Um, but I think companies are, are quite excited at the potential for using the technology. And I think we're also in the early stages. So I think given that we're in the early stages of this developing, um, it, it's going to take a while for people to figure out um, where the, the power of, of this technology is. But it, nevertheless, I, I feel confident that it's it, it's coming. Yeah. I did recently a podcast on AI and we sort of discussed this idea of is it going to take our jobs away? Mm -hmm. And it got more into the uh, area of AI might not be taking whole jobs, but individual yes. tasks. Yes. And I've, if I've heard more and more now about people talking about AI agents, where there's just a little function on the side, it's now automated, but a job in total will not be replaced because there's still a lot of sort of human judgment and, and, and that sort of things that you can't really automate uh, involve. Yes. Jobs might change uh, with the use of this technology, but not necessarily replaced. And in that sense, you know, are, are you looking in incorporating in this are you sort of having a little ai portfolio analyst in the corner we're not really thinking in terms of having dedicated ai research but uh we do use ai in our daily research 
for example, it's a powerful tool for reading transcripts and summarizing them to the point that we're interested in. Um, and so it's it's a great productivity tool. But I, I, for the time being, I can't see us having a dedicated AI analyst. I think our technology analysts are, are really conversant with what's happening. And so they're up to the task of covering the space. Yeah, yeah. Now, I wanted to also address um, diversification because uh, yes. global equities, it's a large universe. Um, there's always a danger of being over diversified. Yes. How do you tackle that problem? Well, so we have a range of 40 to 65 holdings uh, enshrined in our investment policy statement. Uh, and while that's an internal policy statement, it we live by it. So uh, right now we're sitting right around 60 names in the portfolio. And when we get to that, that's kind of the upper range of where we've been. And when we get to that 60 level, typically we institute the discipline of one in, one out. That saves us from name creep. And so it, it's hard sometimes. And because the nice thing about having a central research platform with 35 global analysts is that you have lots of great ideas um, and you'd like to buy them all. But sometimes the best ideas are not going to make it into the portfolio. And so it's our job to make sure where's the opportunity cost highest and, and make sure that the best allocation of capital is, is taking place in the portfolio. And I saw that uh, on, on your website, you, you have uh, sort of a summary of the philosophy uh, that you take to the strategy where you say, um, we're looking for results that are consistently good, not sporadically great. Yes. How do you systemize that into a process? Yeah, so... Um, the way we do it is that two-step process I mentioned. So we stock selection is the first step. And um, obviously we're very rigorous around identifying anomalies in the market where we disagree with what the market's pricing in for the future growth. Um, and there are a lot of those still around the world. It's always interesting how inefficient markets can be in the short term. And then once we've decided that we have a stock that we want to, an idea we want to represent in the portfolio, we have, um, we've built our own uh, in-house risk tools that sit on top of the Barra risk engines. And what we do is we use those to very intentionally implement a risk budget. So we allow ourselves a risk budget of four to 700 basis points in tracking error each year. Uh, we typically, try to keep it at the low end of that. It's usually around 500 basis points. But we have to use that 500 basis points of tracking error as intelligently as possible. It's such a precious resource. And so we want uh, as much of that tracking error as possible coming from stock selection, which is idiosyncratic risk. Uh, it's not, we don't want factor risk running through the portfolio and we don't want style risk dominating returns. Because sometimes you're going to have a value year where value wins in the market. Sometimes you're going to have growth where growth wins. We don't want that, um, that endpoint dependent approach to explain our performance. So we want to outperform no matter whether it's a growth or a value market. And so unintended bets like that are something that this, this tool helps us to keep to a minimum. And so our, our um, idiosyncratic risk typically contributes more than half of our total tracking error, it's around 65% right now. And and so when we look at the, the dominance of the Magnificent Seven, and I think you mentioned mm -hmm. you own three out of out of the seven, has yeah. that made it harder to, to uh, manage this tracking error and to stay within that uh, 500 base point budget? Uh, no, it hasn't actually been too difficult uh, because it's a global index and not a US index. It's actually still within manageable boundaries. I think U.S. investors do suffer from that very problem, the concentration risk. Um, and so it's difficult for them to manage that. If you start to see some of the magnificent names occupy more than 5%, between 5 and 10% of the index, then I think it's going to be an issue. Uh, but so far, we haven't run into that problem. Yeah, yeah. And if we look a little bit about, you know, the broader investment environment, uh, we've seen, of course, in recent times, interest rates uh, ramp up. Mm -hmm. A lot of uncertainty at the moment. I think um, people were expecting some rate cuts, but um, so far, uh, that doesn't seem to be on the card uh, in, in the near future. 
what, how does that in fact sort of uh, or affect the way you look at the, the portfolio construction? So that's a good example of a factor risk. We don't really want to have driving the returns in the portfolio uh, unless we have a really strong view uh, or some sort of edge that we know rates are going to rise or fall and we disagree with the market, then it's the kind of risk that we don't really want dominating the, the portfolio. So we try to diversify and hedge that out. Um, we have had a healthy allocation to interest rate sensitives. So European banks uh, right now, even having done as well as they have over the last year, are still very undervalued in our opinion. It's it's a simple, old-fashioned way of looking at it, but the PEs on on European banks are still lower than their dividend yields, and and they're creating a lot of value by buying back shares. That's just one example, but in general, uh, rates are something that we uh, have to you know try not to be uh, not to take a bet on because we want bottom up stock selection to be driving the alpha. Yeah, yeah. Maybe we can finish up with uh, some of the sectors that potentially uh, are overlooked. I mean, we we talked about Japanese equities and some of the opportunities there. Yeah. We talked about technology companies outside of the Magnificent Seven. Yeah. Are there any sort of other sectors or pockets of the market that you think uh, deserve more attention? Very much so. So we've already talked about semiconductors. So I think the other sectors I'd like to highlight are defense. Uh, I think the world has been underspending on defense. Um, the, the West outside the US, um, which I'm sure you're more than familiar with coming from the Netherlands, has been has not been paying its fair share of the defense budget in NATO, for example. Two thirds of the budget is paid by the US, while it's really uh, Europe that benefits from that military sort of umbrella. Um, so there's going to be a, a long period of catch up where spending on defense has to over-index just to get back to the average, the trend line. And so we think that BA Systems is a good example of where you want to be within defense. And also, I would point out uh, in the US, utilities are an overlooked area, which are very exciting. So um, structurally, the US is going to be short power, short electricity in particular for some time to come because it takes a long time to build out power infrastructure. And for the longest time, we were becoming more efficient in the US. And so we were using the same or even less energy, uh, even while the economy was growing. But now that's changing. Now you're getting to a point where energy demand is actually inflecting upwards, thanks to data centers and AI and just the internet in general. And, and yet um, the the development of the power grid hasn't kept pace. So uh, there are three uh, IPPs, independent power producers in the US, and not many of them are nuclear. Uh, and that's the kind of uh, baseload energy supply you need for all the data center growth that we're seeing. So utilities have been an area that have just started to get attention, but companies that we own like Vistra are still trading on double digit free cash flow yields um, without any demanding assumptions around future growth. And that's probably conservative. Um, and so the market started to notice them, but still has a long way uh, to go. So I, I think some of the more boring industries that the market has been less excited about, like defense and utilities can actually offer really exciting ideas. And that's often where the research has been lacking. And, and that's why the market's somewhat inefficient there. Yeah, so the, the somewhat unloved parts of the market. Uh, the... Right, right. <laughs> very interesting. Well, Julian, thank you very much for your time today. It was great talking to you. Yes, it's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.